Hello, and welcome to Lore Watch, a roundtable freeform discussion about lore and our favorite media. I'm your host, Joe Perez, one of several lore focused folks from Blizzard Watch, and I've got my marvelous co host with me today, Matt Rossi. How are you doing today, Matt? So I'm looking at this picture that Alex Ross drew of various Captain Marvels, and he put Thor in there. Mm -hmm. And I get it, but at the same time, it's like, is so you're putting anybody named Captain Marvel. Anybody named Shazam because he's got the 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 animated Shazam genie in there. Are and you talking the the Echoes of Shazam image? It's just a bunch of different pictures that Alex, I don't know what it was called. Yeah, that, that's what it's, it's called. Alex Ross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's got like Ultraman in it as well. I don't know. I don't remember. I didn't see. If I, I mean, he he might have been. I saw a um, Marvel Man from. Yeah, that's the exact one. So yeah, there he is. So this is that's actually uh, it's a tribute to Alex Ross and all the stuff that he worked on. All right, cool. <laughs> I mean, I didn't think that Alex Ross had done anything with the uh, that particular Captain Marvel over there, but all right. At least that's my understanding of it. It could be wrong, but... I mean, he's even got the robot Captain Marvel that could fire his limbs off and yell split. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also got... What was it? I can't remember. It was the caveman superhero that was like... It was also like a Captain Marvel slash Thor thing. Um, it was on a, it was, no, it wasn't Captain Caveman. It was a human. Um, hmm. He's got like the green, the green cape, the green loincloth, and he's got the he's got the club, and he's got the like the coif with the the green horns on it. It was a Hanna Barbera character. Um, yeah, don't help, man. Yeah, it's there's some really really interesting. It's not Thundar, is it? No, it's not Thundar. No. So, but it's not just it's not just Captain Marvel that it's doing with it. It's uh, this. I swear, this is relevant, folks. Um, it's the influence of Shazam and it's all of the characters that sort of came out around the same time or were inspired by that body of work or inspired by his body of work regarding it. So it wasn't just the Captain Marvels. It was, that's why Shazam is in the centerpiece of it. Um, everything else sort of spawns off from that. And it was a really interesting, uh, like tribute to all of that, uh, that he did. So, and it's, it's basically highlighting how important, uh, Billy Batson was not only to comics, but to pop culture overall, because the success of that character of that, or the original Captain Marvel, which is Shazam, all of these other things spawned off and were able to be created. It was one of my, uh, I don't want to say one of my favorite pieces, uh, but they were talking like, this is back in like 2019, this art came out, but yeah, it's really wild to see how one character influenced so many things down the line, including additional variations of Captain Marvel, different variations of Shazam. Uh, the fact that Thor, uh, uh, there was some inspiration with Thor as well, which I think is probably one of the more fascinating ones. And you'll remember this. Remember when Thor was being in the nineties was being taught a lesson by his father where he was separated from Mjolnir and he was thrown to earth and it went to, uh, I can't remember the, the alter ego named the doctor. Um, but he basically it turned it into a walking staff and the doctor got it. That, and was, then, in the, that was in the nineties. That was the sixties. Was that the sixties? Cause I remember oh, yeah, the that's 90s. the original, that's the original origin of Thor. Um, doctor, I knew his name until you did this to me, but, um, Dr. Blake, yeah, he, Doctor Don Donald Blake, yeah, he's Donald going, Blake. he goes he goes for a walk uh in the woods in of all places, he's in Norway and he's going for a walk like on a vacation and he loses his cane because rock monsters from Saturn show up. Yeah, that's right. And and those guys eventually come back in the Hulk of all places, but uh so he's like, Oh god, what do I do? And he ends up in a cave and he finds a stick and he goes, Well, at least I can use this stick, and he hits the stick against the wall, and boom, he turns into Thor, except he still does Donald Blake's you know, mind. And it's like whoever holds this hammer, he be he be he worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. And then like I they gave the book to Jack Kirby after that. Like yep. you know, it was Kirby and Lee who wrote it, but then they said, Kirby, you just take it. And Kirby was like, He's actually Thor. It's not the doctor thing is something Thor. It's something Odin did to punish him. Yeah, and they, and and they was, came back. They came back later. Re that came back recently, actually, with uh, yeah. some of the stuff that happened. Yeah, they had Donald Blake turn into a lunatic monster who's trying to kill everybody. But yeah, in the sixties and seventies, that was the whole deal. Uh, and they finally, in the it was the eighties, they got rid of 
Don Blake finally, because they just had him realize I am Thor. I'm not a separate person. And he just stopped being Don Blake. Like yeah. the, essentially the, but, the enchantment that turned him back into Donald Blake, whenever the hammer was separated from him was removed. And as a result, he did, just wasn't Don Blake anymore. So he had to, he had to get a secret identity that was just Thor in a plaid shirt with glasses on. Yeah. And he went around for a while doing that. And, and we, this is not what the we're point, here to talk about the, at all. Yeah. The but point yeah. was, is that's why Thor is included in it because that original thing is very similar to how Shazam or uh, when it was originally conceived, Captain Marvel worked. It was essentially an entity sharing a, a physical form, uh, ingesting the power almost he man style. Um, so like, it's well, it's definitely there. And I think actually if I'm looking at this image correctly, I think He Man is yeah, He Man is in the very back as well. Uh right underneath that caveman, uh, and right above Thor's shoulder. So He Man also falls into that paradigm because that was another thing that was established by that es- essentially Captain Marvel slash Shazam legacy. Oh hey, Prime is in there. Yeah, as well. Mm-hmm. Hey, man, Prime. Remember that book? We really meet aren't supposed to be talking about this. I'm but sorry, the, everybody. The 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 reason that I think it's kind of we're going to talk about the other stuff. Don't worry. We'll get there. But I think it's a really interesting thing to look at this and realize, and we talk about this a lot, how much influence storytelling and how much influence characters carry over in between different mediums, different media, different stories and different characters over generations. Even if you don't see those connections right away, and it's the same thing when people talk about like, oh, you know, Warcraft stole this from wherever. It's not really stealing it. It's sort of iterating on it and it's doing their own spin on it, just like this artwork. And I, I highly recommend you guys look up. It's called Echoes of Shazam and see if you can go through and, and see all the wild connections that this one character sort of influenced in, in over the decades of existence uh, and then apply that to a lot of other stuff. We talk about ideas being iterative this is just further proof of that. That's kind of a really cool visualization of it. But that's not what we're here to talk about, even though Matt and I could absolutely do an hour long comic podcast, probably more than an hour long. Marvel Man's in this. So my word, just explaining Marvel Man to people slash Miracle Man for Americans who don't know who Marvel Man is. That would take an entire hour. Yeah. So we're not going to do that. Uh, instead, we're going to go and answer some questions from you, our wonderful listeners. Uh, if you have questions for us, for this or any of our podcasts, be sure to send those into podcasts at blizzardwatch.com. Specify the show that it is for in the subject line. And if you have any special pronunciations of your name, please do me the kindness of including them in the email. Uh, you can also hit us up on Discord. We have two channels set aside on our Discord server. One is for everyone. It's a Q and podcast questions channel, and you can go ahead and same rules apply. Give, ask your question and give us any special pronunciation of your name. Tell us what show it's for. And if you are a Patreon subscriber as a way of saying thank you for helping us keep the lights on, we tend to look there first for those questions in the patron Q and podcast questions channel. As a matter of fact, almost every single one of these came from that channel today. Actually, I think all of them did. All right. First is going to be from Tet Semi, our good buddy, who is going to ask us a question for the Cyberpunk Watch. Uh, if you could, if you choose to help Reed recover Songbird, there's a follow up with Reed where you can ask how she is. His response is troubling at best and maybe foreshadowing how they're going to cure you. He says they weren't able to use the Matrix on her as she was too far gone, foreshadowing if you let them cure you but they were able to help her another way and she might even become an operative again. What is your headcanon version of what's become of Songbird? Go ahead, Matt. Nothing good. I mean, there's three possibilities that come to mind almost immediately. <clears throat> One is they've replaced even more of her and effectively at this point, she's almost full conversion, um, which is something that the technology has existed in cyberpunk for a while. Um, even in Cyberpunk 2020, they had full conversion already. So yeah, Adam Adam Smasher is essentially almost you. What he's basically a full conversion cyborg. Um, but there's ones that go even further than him. Believe it or not, and that's one possibility. Like at, at this point, she is basically a brain and some neurons. Some well, neurons. Uh, isn't in a, is in a he body. basically that too? Is he? Yeah. What's her? What's her? The pop star. Uh, oh no, no, she's she's very converted, but she's not. There's. She still has most of her organic body inside that thing. 
Uh, that's why she's got the skin. The people who have that skin, that's just the skin replacement. You can do that and still be mostly bio, you know, biological. Um, like the ones you see at Compeki Plaza have the same deal. The, the ones are like right there at the, uh, when you walk in and they're like, you know, oh, you know, here's your, uh, here's your room number and all that. Those people are not full conversion cyborgs. That's, that's ridiculously expensive. Um, well, just, I, mean, cause cause I was going to say, conversion. I think the game, I think the game has her listed as full body replacement. But it might, it might. I'm just saying, I don't think you don't need that. Although they do actually have her die when her heart's replaced. That's like mm. a whole thing. When Lizzie, she actually gets it done on stage. She has her heart replaced, and there's a period of time where before they resuscitate her, um, she deliberately flatlines as part of the performance. So it's possible. I don't. I don't know off the top of my head, but I know that they exist because, it, for one thing, Adam Smasher again. For mm-hmm. another thing, we hear about the Russians doing it. Thirdly, there's there's a quest where a guy has uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, and you apparently can't treat that with cyberware unless you just replace the whole freaking body. And so he's going to, he's trying to go to Russia to get that done. And you're like, you know, that's really likely not going to be working, buddy. And he's like, look, I don't have any other option. This is my one shot. So you're like, all right, I'll help you do it. Just, I'm not, I wouldn't expect to this to come, work out well for you. Let me put it that way. Uh, but yeah, it's, so that that's, that's my option one, that I think there's one possibility. Option two is, and this goes also along with the Adam Smasher idea, because we've talked about this before. I am would not be surprised if they engramed her. And and here's why I wouldn't be surprised. She knows exactly how to get into the chip in your head. The the uh the this the save your soul relic trinket. She knows exactly how to connect, communicate with it using black wall protocols. Yep. And that means that the the um you know the the, the I want to say UCAS, but that's that's definitely not what we're talking about. The NUSA. Mm-hmm. Uh the NUSA has the knowledge of how the relic works to the point where they most likely can duplicate it now. Keep my Militech for for whatever, you know, you can you can talk about Arasaka being the bigger, more powerful corporation all you want, but Militech has successfully held them off four times. Mm-hmm. We've had four corporate wars. Militech has won or drawed on all four of them. They they do have a lot of success dealing with Arasaka to the point where Militech actually has a mole inside Arasaka, and it's one of the people that's on the board, for lack of a better word. It's the granddaughter that gets mentioned in Cyberpunk uh, 2077. Um, when he says M- Miko has no problem with her role in it, when, when um, Yarnobu says that, she's the one who's working directly for uh, Militech. She is their mole. They pay her, and she gives them information. So they, they have a really good idea of what's going on with the Arasakas. Uh, and as a result, they have a good idea of how the relic works. So they could very easily have come up with something analogous. Uh, it was Joe who first mentioned that he thought that that might be what they do the, with Adam Smasher. Like every time Adam Smasher yeah. dies or gets damaged or whatever, they just pull out another Engram and just slop him back in another full conversion body. They could easily have done that. Especially now that they've had a chance to study V. Yeah, so I, I want to let you finish because that—that's where my theory, I think, starts. Is with go the, ahead. What I'll do my. V. I'll do my third after you to go. Go ahead. So one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot with this, especially because uh, Dan from the site has been playing Cyberpunk after listening to our podcast talking about it. So we sucked him in. So for everybody else that we sucked in, I'm sorry and you're welcome. Uh, and we're talking about the ideas behind it. And when you get to this ending where V gets, and I'm air quoting cured here uh, by Reed and, and the, the, the organizations that he works with, I all started thinking that part of the reason why you were, and I'm going to air quote here again, out for so long is not because you were out. It's because you're dead. And we talked about this before that one of the things that cyberpunk, the game doesn't do, but cyberpunk, the tabletop talks about is the designer bio or organic uh, stuff that is existing in night city because it does. And the government makes use of it as well. And I'm not just talking like test tube babies. We're talking like full grown organ replacements and uh, things like that. But one of the things I was thinking about is what if they just figured out how to use that and clone you and put your brain back in your body? If you're an engram in a homegrown body, in a brand new body, and this is something that they haven't been doing before, because, again, Adam Smasher, 
that's a full body replacement, right? That's, that's mm-hmm. inorganic stuff. That's not recreating life. That's putting an engram in a shell that it can walk around in totally different thing has all the memories, has everything else, but it's still a manufactured body out of machine and Chrome. When you get to the bioorganic stuff, now you start getting into the esoteric part of cyberpunk 77 and seven, which has been there from the very beginning. It starts with you talking with Misty and it's sort of, it's ever present throughout it. There's this idea of spirituality, uh, even in the ARG stuff, there's this idea of spirituality in the stuff with the blue eye cult um, and the Methuselah cult. Uh, and, and you see a lot of this. And if you do all the side quests, you'll actually come across a lot of this. And the ARG th- project with the, what talks about, not just transitioning worlds, but there's a bunch of spirituality and mysticism around it that exists in its own separate layer. And um, why can I think of her name? The, the fixer, um, the, the, Jap- the Japan town fixer, Chinatown fixer. Morkako. Morkako. Morkako talks about it. Morkako, uh, not Morkako. Yeah. But she, she talks about it. And that's a big thing there too, where they still talk about the spirituality of it. I think there's a good possibility that your V ending is you were the test run. You were not the asset they cared about. Not really, but you are a convenient test subject who was willing to be there. And so you're dying by the time you go in and go with them. You are literally dying. It is time. If they ice you and pull an engram of your personality out and then grow you a new body and shove you into it, you're not going to know, but that could be a reason why you can't use cyberware again because you're not a real like natural born body. They don't know how to do deal with what's there or, or the fact that the cyber load isn't possible with the synapse that you have there because the engram can't really handle it because there's not really a sufficient interface or at least not with your model. I mean, for that matter, it might also be that they don't actually grow a completely new clone body. Mm -hmm. I mean, the brain might still be the original brain. Possibly. And they just grow, like they go full conversion. A full conversion cyborg is literally a brain in an in a artificial body. The next step could very well be a brain in a brand new body. Also possible. But, I, but my, mm-hmm. if you do it that way, the thing about that is, you, you know, you're basically having to fight rejection and they had to scrape God knows how much of your brain out. Yep. The stuff that Johnny was in already, that by itself could be the problem. There could be a lot of different reasons why. But that could be also you could have been the test subject for what they were eventually going to do with Songbird. Ooh, or, however, there is another possibility. Go for it. V is a V is extremely dangerous. Yeah. If you, depending on the version of the story you take, your V might have made a deal with Reed after helping Songbird get to the spaceport. True. And that means that V has also used the Black Wall. And has basically defeated everything that the NUSA had to stop them. The only reason they get their hands on Songbird in that version is because V is betrayed by Songbird and says, F it, take her. I I don't want to kill Reed, take her. And so in that version, you would not want to leave V with the ability to use cyberware. You might want to keep your word and you might want to keep V around. Because if you ever need that... Mm -hmm. You want to be able to reactivate it. But in the meantime, letting that walk around with the ability it had, no, thank you. And even if it isn't the V that if that you don't go that route, if V is like working with them the whole time, this person stole from Arasaka. This person managed to get through this, this Sinusure lab. This person is still astonishingly dangerous. We don't necessarily want this person able to like but, you'll notice that the thing that reed keeps offering you is a job mm-hmm. after they tell you you can't use cyber anymore he's immediately offering you a job at langley mm-hmm. why so they can keep you where they want you if they have to use you again it might you might not have that ability because they took it and they could put it back v- victor thought at first he could put it back Maybe he saw looking at it goes, oh, well, this looks like, but oh no, that wouldn't work. But he doesn't realize there's another step that they left in there so they could do it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it, it, it's, it, it's one possibility re, re, that just in the mind while you were talking. Which is fine. But regard, regardless of the V stuff, I, I do think that there's a possibility that everything that happens to V is a test run for Songbird. Absolutely. 
Um, because or think for that matter, it might very well be they were working on them parallel so they could monitor, okay, she's still alive. Go ahead with that one. Like literally doing it right. They're in literally tandem, doing yeah. they did a V. And then if it works and V doesn't die, okay, keep going. Because the the thing that the thing that gets me about it is the one thing that we never really understand and it's never really been explained and they don't really go into it here and maybe they'll go into it in the, the next cyberpunk game is what the Matrix was. They don't talk yeah. about that, but Matrix makes about, me they, yeah they talk about it just in terms of what it's doing to the AI in it. Yes, but it's like a one shot casing for an AI. But what is that AI doing to well, them? Hold on a second. What does that sound like though? What other program cased an intelligence as a single shot and basically completely captured and encoded it? We literally had a whole thing about it. It's the yeah, whole soul killer. soul killer. So the Matrix feels like it's essentially another version of AIs. Of, yeah. And, and there's a reason that I think there's a reason I think that the Matrix was their response to Soul Killer. Yes, and because yeah. also think of the thing about it this way too, Songbird had already been basically going through the same thing you were, just with AI instead of having Johnny and Engram, which is an AI essentially in your head. Songbird was hooked up to the Black Wall. Songbird, Song, Songbird was essentially in direct communication with AI and going through a similar degeneration. There's nothing to say at the end of it that you're nothing more than essentially an AI that needs to be mapped and contained. If you're an engram, you are. Because if you're an engram, you are. Yeah. Once you become an engram, as Alt points out, you know you basically you're now you're a different person, you're a different being. So when when even the in the main endings, when Alt pulls you out of your body, makes you an engram, and then reinjects you back in your body, you're now essentially an AI. The body yep. is even going to view you as a foreign AI because your the body has been converted to work for the original AI, to, to the new, the first AI for Johnny. Yeah. So yeah, there, there's a lot of possibility there. Mm -hmm. But it, there is a possibility that we will see Songbird later on. It's, you know, in when he says that she might even become an operative again, maybe. The other thing that I think is interesting is there's no limit to what they could potentially manipulate for memories as well yeah they and that's going into my third theory so let me know when you're ready <laughs> go for it songbird is v that is songbird in the ending that's not v interesting yeah because if you want to keep your asset but your asset is bound and determined to not do they're not malleable the way that v is more malleable V is more willing to do what has to be done to stay alive. Songbird would rather die than go back, but V would rather go back than die. V will make a deal with Arasaka in some versions of the game. V is more flexible. And so what's a great way to keep Songbird around? Make her think she's V. Put V's memories in the, in the Songbird body. You know, grow, grow a new body, put V's memories in it, but the V's memories are just there as a casing. Again, remember the casing idea. You you keep Songbird essentially neutralized by putting her in V. Or, and this is the one that I think is more likely, but still based around the same basic idea. Songbird, when he when he says, you know, we couldn't save her, you know, that way, we found another way to help her. What if you know you could literally put her on ice? Mm -hmm. We know that Raish Bartmoss did that, right? And why can't V use the web anymore? Why can't V you know, because Songbird is running through all that OS system that is the brain, all that altered stuff that was going to hold Johnny. It's a place you could basically allow Songbird to connect to it. And thus, while she's in her, like, you know, her ice box, whatever, she's experiencing these experiences through a link. And as a result, she will never need when when you decide you're going to use songbird again you can pull her out and she won't need to be educated as to what has been going on she will immediately know like she won't have that it's been 10 years things are so different no she'll know full well 10 years have passed it, it's like cuz there's a, that weird bit at the end if you do the ending where you help songbird and that there's that weird bit at the end where they are basically thinking the same thoughts when she shares the black wall with V, they're one person. Even Johnny Which comments on this. Yeah, and don't forget that this is also not the first time that V's touched the black wall. No, it isn't. The black wall lets her through. And, you know, we could say Alt is the one who decides that. But no, 
how many times are we told that the black wall is its own AI? A lot. And just one that the other AIs think of as a traitor because it won't let them in. Its boundary condition is to keep them out. Why does it so eager to keep them out? Unless it, you know, we, and we see if you, if you get the Erebus gun or the deck, I can't remember the name of the deck because I'd never played the deck to that level. Um, but when you get the Erebus gun, the the thing that the voice that starts talking to you, the AI that's talking to you, is the Black Wall, and the Black Wall thinks of us as its property. Oh yeah, they made this thing to keep the other AIs out, and it's like, yeah, they're mine, and and they'll they'll do as I wish. And and there's really have you have you done the Delamain missions after you get that thing? Have you have you at any point gotten the Erebus weapon? Oh yeah, and yeah, then, yeah, yeah. You know it's. It drops some really weird hints about what's going on with him, about what's going on with Delamain and, and Delamain's essentially Delamain butted into like multiple minds. And that's something that AIs apparently can do. And think about what that means for, for Alt, who's absorbing all the minds out of the, uh, the, uh, the prison out of Makoshi or Johnny, who is, you know, there, there's a lot to this man. So yeah, I think there's a real possibility that there's, various ways songbird could still be around and for that matter various ways that we could see v again if they wanted to i i'm going to say right now i don't think the next cyberpunk game is going to have v in it as a playable character i agree i wouldn't mind if it did i like Lee, but i think in the end v will be a legend who maybe gets mentioned occasionally um somebody people talk about uh depending on too where the game is set if the game is set in night city people are definitely going to be talking about v and they'll, they'll probably have to decide how much of a canon ending they want to have. But, yeah, because that's the other thing about the game that we don't know, and maybe we'll never know, is just exactly how, I guess, which of the endings of the many endings are, you know, going to be viewed as canonical. Yeah, and I think one way so, around that is to just never say it. You just never talk about it. You you broad strokes it that this stuff happened, Arasaka took a hit, but you don't. You, they, I mean, my theory is they might very well go straight into the four, the, the fifth corporate war. Oh yeah, um, maybe. Because especially if they do it like twenty, you know, Cyberpunk twenty eighty or something, like because we know that seventy eight, we we get to seventy eight in the in one of the endings from uh, from uh, Dogtown, uh, from from Phantom Liberty. One of the Phantom Liberty endings takes you to twenty seventy eight. So if the next game is in twenty eighty or twenty eighty five or whenever it is, if it's in Night City at all, and it might be. Well, we know that Jefferson, and that's the thing too. We're going to have to talk about this. I'm sorry, man. We're going to have to talk about this. Uh, Jefferson Perales becomes mayor. Canonically, he is mayor yes. by the end of uh, the game. And either he is completely unaware that his mind has been heavily modified and altered by something, which we're pretty sure is AIs running, running from Night Corp or possibly AIs that run Night Corp. Uh, with Mr. Blue Eyes as a possible part of that whole deal. Joe has just talked about it, so we, it's that kind of thing. So either he's completely unaware that he's a puppet, or he's now paranoid about being a puppet because you told him about it. And either way, that's useful to them. They can run, they can run him either way. So if Perales is mayor, Perales is the, the political party Perales is in is, is pro-reunification with the NUSA. But a lot of Night City isn't pro NUSA. Um, there are a lot of people in Night City who think of the NUSA as as like a garbage nightmare backwater. They don't want anything to do with it. So if there's going to be, and we know there's going to be a fifth corporate war because Arasaka is gearing up for it. Um, if there's going to be a fifth corporate war, it, Night City would be a really interesting place for it to happen. Like it, it's very likely it could happen. The Sinershore Labs in Dogtown are just one of the various corporate assets that were in night city at the time of that, of the last corporate war and of, you know, the attempted retaking of night city in the 2060s. And all of this has to do with, you know, the, the whole Perales storyline is about people having their minds altered without them knowing. And we see that it's more than just the Perales's. There's a whole bit where the the, the uh, screen flashes multiple images of people who are having their brains altered, and that whole bit with the blue. And jo- Johnny even calls out, "Does this remind you of anything?" Like, and it's it does because it's what's happening to V. So all of this, 
all of these people who are having their minds altered, they're being turned into other people in one way or another. Songbird is one. You're one. There's all those people. And it all ties back to Mr. Blue Eyes again. And when you're in, if you are doing the bit where you're helping Songbird escape, you're in the spaceport. Mr. Blue Eyes is there watching you. Not just when you're in the spaceport. When you go to pick up Songbird, oh, yeah. there's somebody in, a, in the alley. He, he's, you know, it looks like the average homeless vet person they have, except but he's got the blue, blue eyes. eyes. Yeah. And they're not just blue eyes. They're glowing. They're like, you know, the blue eyes that Mr. Blue Eyes has. And then there's like the whole Jerry the Prophet deal. Which we've barely even scratched on, or the whole deal with uh with what do you call it? Maelstrom, mm-hmm. and the the blood ritual they do where they they literally download an AI into a woman's head apparently, like and you end up fighting her and like oh yeah she's a cyber psycho mm, not according to all this stuff buddy so yeah there's there's a ton of possibilities for this idea uh, I definitely think there could very well be an entire like vat farm of songbirds. Where like the if they have the Ingram, they could just keep making bodies for her, and they could just keep using her indefinitely as long because she's the one who can work the black wall, and the black wall wants someone to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. The black the it's it's the AIs that were gonna get her out of the NUSA's grip in the first place. You know why would Mister Blue Eyes you know contact her? Why would he make the deal? He triggered literally everything you see in Phantom Liberty. Yeah, no, that's true. He did, didn't he? Yeah, it's all because he reached out to her and and said, you know, hey, would you like some help? Would you like to get out of there? That he caused all of this, everything you see in that game. And the thing that gets me too is Hanson knew about it from the start because he named it Dogtown, and the labs were called Sinosure. Sinosure comes from it's like dog place. It's like the kino in it is from the Greek word for dog. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. It, when he called it Dogtown, he's calling it Sinusure out. He's calling it Sinusure without calling it Sinusure so that the people at the top, that you, you won't ever wonder why they didn't kill him in the first place? Because he was flat out telling them, I know what this is. I know where you put me. And I know why you're too afraid to try and take me out. Go, don't push me or I'll reveal this. He was telling them that from the beginning. And the only reason he ends up dead is because he pushed it too far. Either because, you know, he, he gets himself killed by Alex or he gets himself killed by V. In either case, he's doing he basically gets killed because he just couldn't leave well enough alone. It wasn't enough to have the, the threat to hold over their heads. He had to actually physically try to get the threat. And he was not, as, as good as he was, he was not ready for that level of of opponent because it wasn't even it's not songbird or v or reed that's not his opponent that he doesn't know he's fighting it's mr blue eyes Mm -hmm. it's the it's the whatever ais are involved in this and the black wall is very definitely one of them because you see what happens The, the black wall completely takes out the stadium every time songbird does something with the black wall it's the black wall doing something with songbird Mm -hmm, mm mm-hmm To the point where when you're in the Sinusure lab and that robot is chasing you around, that robot is is the is the black wall. And and it's it's deliberately hunting you. And it's telling you the whole time, you know, you don't know what you're doing. You have no idea what's at stake. You have no idea what you're playing with. It's just it's really messed up. And and Songbird, if you, you hear that she might become an operative again. If that's happen if that happens, it's because that's what the AIs want because there's no, there's very little songbird left by the end because it's replacing her memories. Remember Mm -hmm. just like the paralysis. And she says, I don't remember that anymore. The paralysis. He doesn't even remember. He had a brother. His brother's buried in the columbarium. He doesn't remember the guy anymore. He grew up with that guy. That's his brother. He does not remember him. So yeah, it, it is. There's, there's a real possibility that V might not even be V anymore. Like maybe V died and they grew a clone body. Maybe V is literally some poor person off the street. They picked up and physically reconditioned to look like V and put V's Engram in that. There's, there's so many possibilities for what the identity issues could be here. Uh, but I think I'm going to stop because yeah, I've been, if I don't make myself stop, we'll be going all day.
Yeah. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question to Temi. I'm sure it raises more questions than it answered, but we'll see. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and move on to our next question here, which we should have just enough time to answer in theory, uh, which is going to be from Hera three, uh, Hera three, a night elf hunter from Cadgar. Well, congratulations. Also, question- Hera three, thank you very much for the pronunciation guide. That's yes. really helpful. Thank you. Uh, a question about world souls and what happens when they die. As we know, the death of the fell corrupted Argus is what took the Arbiter out of commission. We also know that Zolval was the original Arbiter before he became disillusioned with the order of things by the first ones. I'm curious, however, how the death of that void infested planet when it was first murdered by Sargeras affected the Pantheon of Death. I understand that the fact that Argus was riddled with fell likely played a significant role in why the Arbiter was so unable to handle it, and therefore why killing the other worlds that Sargeras decimated during the Burning Crusade likely wouldn't have done the same to her because they weren't enslaved and corrupted, per se, like Argus was. But if that world soul was what that was void infested was so far gone that Sargeras felt he had to kill it and was likely the very first world soul to ever experience death, would it not make sense that the soul would also have had a similarly devastating effect? And to add on top of that, do we know or do we think that Zoval was still the arbiter when that happened or had the mental had already been passed on? Um. I'm just going to say this is going to be a very complicated potential set of questions, but I'm going to, since Matt talked a lot about cyberpunk, I'm going to go first here because, well, that's I fine. want to yeah, go ahead. So here's the thing. Argus wasn't just a world soul. When he died, Argus had been forced into physical manifestation. Argus, when we kill him was born. And we don't know if that was the first time he had been given physical form or if the entire time, uh, his soul had been chained in a incorporeal state uh, being used as the fuel uh, for the, you know, whims of Sargeras. The interesting thing you bring up is about the other world soul that died, though, that void infested one. There's a couple things, though, that we don't know. One, how close was that soul, the world soul to being born? Was it a new one? Was it a very nascent one? Had it actually gained any form of consciousness? Two, is it still a world soul when it is completely fell or completely void corrupted or had it altered what it was to the point where did it have a soul or anything left in order to go to the afterworld or the, the shadowlands when it died or three, was it actually even a world soul? So this one I've been thinking about a little bit too recently because I've been talking about Sargeras and uh, how that man loves to uh, make assumptions. How do we know? that it was actually a world soul and not he was tricked into believing that it was a world soul because those, uh, those wonderful little minions of Sire Denathrius seem to have a real knack for showing people what they want or what they fear the most in order to get them what they want. The Nathrazim are really, really good at that. And when Sargeras found the void infested planet, who was there worshiping at the void infested planet? The Nathrazim. All of them, literally all of them. We've seen what damage a single Nathrism can do with deception and the magics that they wield. And to be fair, I don't even think we've seen the full extent of the magics they can wield. What happens when you have all of them working together? What if that was the entire plan? Find some void infested planet that doesn't actually have a world soul in it. And your job is to make a Titan think that there is that Sargeras is something we can manipulate. Let's manipulate it. Uh, he seems to be the one that we have the most po- opportunity to take advantage of. Let's go ahead and do so. And they probably scouted him beforehand. They probably looked at how he dealt with other things and how he interacted with the Pantheon, because that's the other thing the Nathrazim are really, really good at being sneaky and stealthy. Maybe there was no world soul. Maybe Argus is actually the first world soul to ever be sent to the Shadowlands, which is why it was an unprecedented thing and why it broke the robot Arbiter. The other option is that Zoval was still in charge at the time when it did happen and there was a world soul and he just knew how to deal with it. But, and this is the big, but there that's what helped open his eyes to the fact that there was a universe beyond this with entities that he didn't know existed beforehand and started him down his dark path. At least those are the initial theories that I have been thinking about, uh, well before this question ever came in. And now I'm going to stop and let Matt talk and see what he has. Oh, I mean, 
Oh, that was really cool and interesting. Um, and I really like the idea of them them tricking him. That would that'd be really cool. I will put out something slightly different though. The Arbiter got fed the the soul of Argus uh, because Zoval and and Denathrius specifically made it happen. Mm-hmm. There's a point uh, when you kill Argus. There's a point in the in the, the when you turn in the quest to turn in you know the drop of of blood to uh, Cadgar, where the the quest text makes it clear this should not have happened. It's entirely possible that it only happened because they took the moment to use their very great Titan level power to tip the scales, but Argus otherwise wouldn't have died, couldn't have died. Like we see that when the Titans usually die, their souls bottled, remain in the physical form. Or yeah, the physical in the universe. universe. Yeah, yeah, they don't leave. They don't go anywhere. So you can kill a Titan. You can destroy its, you know, its physical form. But the Titans themselves can use their power to pres- to preserve themselves and a- attempt to regain some kind of physical structure. We've seen this. So why why did Argus not do any of that? Because they wanted Argus to overload the Arbiter. The Arbiter is not prepared to judge the soul of an entity as vast and powerful as an actual titan or an actual endless like you'll notice that at no point does the arbiter pass judgment on zoval Mm -hmm. it can't it's not prepared for that that is not what it is designed for so when asking the question why didn't that first world soul that got fell void corrupted why didn't it have a similar effect i mean there's multiple possibilities. One possibility is it did have that effect. Zoval was the current arbiter when that happened, and it drove him cuckoo for cocoa puffs. That's that's one possibility that you could argue. Uh, there's not a lot to support it, but you could totally you know start building you know an, an, the idea that Zoval's obsession with had the first ones got it wrong could have been when he got slammed in the head by the consciousness of a former being much like itself that had been corrupted and, and defiled by the void. That, that could be what happened. We know that the void has made its way to the Shadowlands before. So, yeah. But another possibility is quite simply that when Sargeras killed that world soul, he killed it before it could become, like as, as uh, Joe pointed out, it hadn't been born yet. Uh, destroying the world might literally have freed it. Like it might have been the equivalent. For all we know, when he did that, he saved it. Like it, it's possible that it went back to wherever Titan Souls originally come from to be eventually sent back into this world, just like we've seen in the Shadowlands. Like it's quite possible there's another realm where like nascent things that haven't been born yet can go and be relived. Mm-hmm. They can, you know, we don't know. But that might be where it went, or it might have just been discorporated. The void might have consumed it. These are all possibilities, but we do know that Zoval and Denathrius had to work together to grab Argus and and use him like a weapon against the Arbiter. And without them both actively doing that, there's no reason to assume that Titan Souls would ever go to the Shadowlands. Mm Mm-hmm. Because we've seen the Titans, multiple Titans died, and their spirits didn't go anywhere. Yeah, the only the only caveat being that they were fully formed at the time, right? They were, yeah, they, they were, were living whatever, yeah. whatever they apotheosis, were whatever apotheosis that causes a Titan to be born has happened. Yeah, so. and we don't know, you know, as Joe pointed out, we don't know that that void world, the void, the void Titan that they was trying to make, we don't know that it ever got to that point. The other thing um, to consider too, though, especially with Argus, and, and this is just something I thought of it, the Titans going back to the original story when they were defeated and, you know, they slammed their, essentially their souls into their keepers bodies and stuff like that. That was a conscious decision and choice that they made. Mm-hmm. Nobody taught Argus anything. No, he didn't have, a mentor. Yeah. He had a tormentor. And as you pointed out, he didn't even his birth into a physical form wasn't by choice. No, he was pulled out. And and he's it's kind of like all right, this is gonna get a little weird, guys, but I was born a month and a half premature. Hey, and this, was in the we 90s, common. And this was in the nineteen seventies when I was literally like on the record books. Like the like I was like one of the most premature babies born. And the idea of like as a premature baby, in many ways, you're still not ready. 
Like you mm-hmm. shouldn't be out here. Um, now, doing that to Argus, how would that cripple him? How would that deviate his personality, his being from what it's supposed to be? You're forcing him to be alive before he's ready for it. Like think about Azeroth and how in many ways it's still a baby. Mm -hmm. It's still a baby that just wants to be warm and safe. It cries when it's afraid. It, It doesn't, it doesn't want, it's not even a baby yet. It's still in the, it's still in there drawing from the world that it, that is its like womb. It doesn't, it, it doesn't have words for anything when it's trying to tell Magni what's going on. It's always using pain and fear and images. Uh, and we know that in war within, we're going to be hearing something. It's possible that all this trauma that it's been through has caused it to accelerate too. So Argus, when it died, Argus might not have been, you know, cognizant of what its options were. As Joe pointed, you know, nobody showed Argus anything. There was no learning process. Nobody came along and taught it. Uh, Instead, Sargeras hooked it up like a car battery and used it to power his, I control, you know, you don't go back to the nether now. You go where I tell you to go machine that he built. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's so many different possibilities that we we can't speak definitively on the issue. But I do think, go go ahead. ahead. I was going to say the thing that I think we can agree on though, is I don't know that him being fell tinged, is even on the table because at the end of the day, Argus wasn't fell corrupted. Argus was enslaved, right? Sargeras had accepted fell. Yeah. Sargeras brought the fell into himself. Right. And they just channel energy. But we talked about this, I think last week and and maybe the week before it's, it's been a while. Uh, But we talked about the fact that Sargeras, it doesn't look like a, what we would assume a fell corrupted Titan is, he doesn't look green. He doesn't look twisted. He is definitely different than the golden icon that he was of his chisel perfection, but that could be a, a choice of how he presents himself. We don't know uh, how sort of Titans manifest that. Uh, it could be like how dragons get their visage, right? But Argus isn't fell corrupted. He's not a demon. He's not. No. He's not diminished because of that. He's diminished because his power is being used as the battery for the facility. And if you're going through the facility, one of the things that I think is really interesting is what is the one thing in the Argus raid you don't see? You don't see fell like you see power, you see energy, you see demons, but it's not like it's built on an engine of nothing but fell, which I think is very, very fascinating. So I think we need to keep that in mind, too, because I have a feeling that had they had shoved a fell power through the shadowlands we would probably see a whole lot more destruction and warping of the shadowlands which they didn't want they didn't want it to be warped because they zoval wanted it to be there for his needs he wanted the power of those realms he needed the building block and the materials of it he didn't want to destroy his things and what is fell we've talked about this a lot fell is a, a mutating factor it's a very powerful force that can be used for destruction, but it mutates it. So Vol doesn't want something to mutate out of his control. He wants to control what that mutation is. So yeah, I don't think Argus was, was actually fell corrupted. What do you think, Matt? I definitely agree that he's not fell corrupted. It's obvious that his entire essence is not based in fell. Like you the green sun thing. The green sun is the thing from which he screams. Mm hmm. That's, it's not him. It's the thing that, that he is imprisoned within. It's the fell cage that they used to hold him. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I think all we can really say about what Argus was, was that he was not ever in control of what he was. Yeah. I think that's true. At no point does Argus get to make a decision. So that's, that's my, my ultimate end take on it. Yeah. And, and I think that's the biggest, the biggest factor as well, right? Like if, you're a Titan and you die and you're a Titan that was born essentially prematurely. Don't know the extent of your power because you've never been trained or taught or talked to or nurtured or anything like that. And instead of been made into a battery, you're pulled in, you're told to fight, you fight, uh, you get defeated. None of those, uh, Titans are paying attention to you. They're not grabbing your soul. Like Sargeras did to the Pantheon. Uh, your souls is kind of floating out in space. Uh, and then if, the agents of the Shadowlands see it and say, 
okay, well, you've passed on from this mortal coil. Follow me. We'll take you to the next realm. And it goes, oh, okay. I don't have to go back in my cage. I guess I'll follow you. And then gets sent like a rocket through the arbiter. That's a whole other thing, right? Like it's, it's, it's potentially very, very different. But we, I don't know if we'll ever actually know the answer to that question. Shadowlands still has a lot of unresolved loose ends that I'm absolutely confident will never bite us in the butt as we move forward. Um, clearly never. That's never happened in the history of this game. But I think that's all I have for answers today. Matt, do you have anything mm. else you want to add to that? No, I think we, geez, dude, we spent like 40 minutes on the first one. I, I think I have used up every ounce of energy <laughs> I got left. All right. Well, I think we're going to call it there, folks. Uh, so thank you very much because Blizzard Watch is made possible due to the generous contributions at patreon.com slash Blizzard Watch. Your continued support means that this podcast signing community is able to thrive and grow. Blizzard Watch supporters enjoy exclusive benefits like early access to our podcast, better chance of having your question answered on our podcast for the queue and an ads free site experience. Again, if you have questions for this or any of our podcasts, be sure to send those into podcast at blizzardwatch.com. Specify the show that it is for in any pronunciations of your name. Uh, if you don't want to send us an email, you can hit us up on Discord. The Q and Podcast Questions channel is open for everyone. Same rules apply. And if you are a Patreon subscriber, as a way of saying thank you, we have the Patreon Q and Podcast Questions channel set aside where you can answer your questions and we look there first. And that's where every single one of these, well, two questions that we answered today came from. But with that, folks, we'll see you next week. <laughs>